Good afternoon. I'm Chris Cardona, Senior Program Officer for Philanthropy at the Ford Foundation. Welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm excited to be in conversation with today's guest, Diana Campoamor, who is the founder of Nuestra America Fund and editor of If We Want to Win, a Latina Vision for a New American Democracy, which came out just yesterday. Congratulations. Uh, and we have two of the contributors to the volume, Ana Maria Argilagos, who's the president and CEO of Hispanics and Philanthropy, and Alexandra Aquino Fike, who's most recently, as of just last week, president of Vice President of Development at the East Bay Community Foundation and is currently the board chair of the Mauricio Aquino Foundation. Have you ever seen so many Latina philanthropists in one place? Goodness me. <laughs> So Latina people make up the second largest ethnic and racial group in America with a population of more than 60 million, according to the latest census. We've been integral to shaping the country's economy, culture, and politics, yet our diversity within our community remains misunderstood, our contributions are often ignored, and our concerns are often overlooked. Today, we'll be addressing what it means to be Latina, including why that term relative to some others you may have heard, and we'll sketch out a blueprint for a more inclusive and just democracy during these politically divisive times. Before we start, I'd like to remind our audience to submit their questions in the YouTube chat or the comment section. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible toward the end of this uh, slightly more than an hour long program. So let's get started. Uh, Diana, one thing I was surprised to learn from the introduction to the book is that the term United States of America uh, the of America part, uh, is a relatively recent vintage. Um, tell us about the word America and what it means to you and the vision that you mm -hmm. have for a new American democracy. Right. Thank you, Chris. And, and thank you to my, my colleagues at the Commonwealth Club, to Ana Mari, to, uh, to Alex. Um, as you know, Chris, our anthology is really a group effort, you know, a quilt of many, many American stories and to answer your question, you know, the we use America as in the, you know, exchangeable with the United States. But the term America actually was not used in the 19th century, it began to be used in the 20th century. In the 19th century, we referred to ourselves as the Union or the Republic. But as Theodore Roosevelt um, was part of the Spanish-American War, and as the country um, tried to uh, acquire, you know, other uh, territories, there was an imperial vision that all of us, you know, meaning the United States and its territories, that we were America. And the reason I start that with that in my preface is because I came here as a child. I was 11 years old. I was coming from Cuba. My parents were political refugees. And when I arrived, I was surprised that immediately I was told that I was not an American. In my definition, Cuba was in the Americas and I was an American, although maybe not an American from the United States. And so my point is that our vision for the future needs to be inclusive, not only inclusive of Latinos who live in the United States and in some cases have lived for generations and generations, but also of everyone else who is in the continent of the Americas, North and South. Mm. Mm. That's a compelling vision. And it really makes me think differently about using that term America. I think of my relatives in Colombia who would say, no, you're, you're Norte Americano. And I would say, oh, soy Americano. No, you're Norte Americano. Or, or the term estadounidense, right? Like someone from the United States, but uh, rather than American. Um, speaking, of ter speaking of terms, could you unpack a little bit why you all um, opted to use Latina in the title uh, of the book as opposed to Latinx or Latino or Hispanic or or any other term? Why, why that choice? I assume it was intentional. Absolutely. And, and thank you. Thank you for asking that question. I think the main thing is all the terms are fine. You know, people should be able to I, use the term that they identify with. And in our book, we use all of them. We use Hispanic, we use Latino, we use Latinx, we use Latine. I chose, our team chose 
Latine because it is number one, gender neutral, and number two, it is a reference to a movement in the Spanish language, which is a language that many of us speak in addition to English, to you know, turn the language gender neutral. And so it was a tip of the hat. And we also believe that you know, these terms continue to change. And uh, we believe that this is the term that will be um, in use in the next uh, two or three years because of that reason. But again, this is not to say this is the term. No, yeah. they're all terms that describe our communities because, in fact, we're a very diverse community and different different groups use different um, identities. Yeah, I'm, I'm increasingly starting to think of it like pronoun, like uh, gender pronouns, right? Like you. It's just a courtesy mm -hmm. to ask, what do you what do you use? Um, and different yeah. ones of us will have different preferences you, as you talk about. Um, Alex, turning to you for a moment, um, mm -hmm. one of the challenges uh, with the prevailing narrative about Latina folks is that it's so often only about need and about lack, right? Um, in your chapter, which is about uh, a transnational movement to learn the fates of the disappeared from El Salvador's civil war in the in 1980s, um, you write really, really movingly about both trauma and privilege, right? Sort of those two things alongside each other. What has the relationship between trauma and privilege uh, looked like in your own advocacy? Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, it's a great question. And um, I'm, uh, it's, I'm honored to be part of this panel and honored to be part of this book. Um, as you can see in the article, I did do a lot of personal exploration. And that connection between trauma and privilege kind of came out for me in the process of writing. So, um, you know, when Dan asked me to participate in this anthology, um, I definitely focused on the personal on the personal odyssey of my family. So as if, if you read the article, you can see that um, my own father, Mauricio Aquino Chacon, was disappeared when I was a baby. I was born in El Salvador. My parents were activists in the you know, left wing student movement. Um, and because of his own um, beliefs and 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 his uh, desire to fight for a stronger democracy and human rights, um, he was forcibly taken from our home and we never got any official notice. We never, you know, re um, received his remains. Um, but it really, as, as my family has grappled with that, that trauma, um, it really came, became clear to me that we're one of if you can say lucky, we're definitely one of the more privileged um, families in that we, we had more access to um, official channels to file grievances. We had more access to information and we had access. Ultimately, we realized to this very transnational, international set of actors. So once my once I really kind of decided to own that privilege, um, being bilingual, having dual nationality, being an attorney, um, it really gave me the strength to try to organize other young people. Um, I didn't realize until I was an adult that, you know, over 10,000 Salvadorans were disappeared during the, the armed conflict. And it is actually an international human rights abuse under UN conventions. Mm. Other countries um, in the world have been much better at really grappling with these kinds of post-war um, traumas. But it, it, I think El Salvador, and I would argue, and I try to argue this in, our, in my article, that much of Latin America hasn't really dealt with the trauma in our region, going all the way back to the Conquista era. Um, but almost every country in Latin America has had some kind of armed conflict uh, or revolution. Um, and it really goes uh, deep to the roots of disparity and equity in our region. And I think if we do, um, for those of us who live in the US, if we really do want a strong democracy across Latin America, then all of us from philanthropists gov to government uh, agencies, those with power and privilege, we really do need to be investing in strengthening democracy and human rights in our region. And until we do that, then you're going to be seeing repeats of um, human rights abuses and weakening of democracy, which is happening again in El Salvador as we speak. The current president and the administration have basically thrown out their version of the Supreme Court. They have uh, installed new uh, favorable judges who have basically allowed the current president 
to keep running as, as much as he wants. He's called himself the coolest dictator in the world on social media and already started to uh, disband or weaken uh, critical you know, democratic institutions. So I'm quite concerned for the fate of El Salvador, um, but it's not just El Salvador. We're seeing this trend across Central America and across South America. So my hope is that my article gives activists like mm. me kind of lessons and courage to perhaps organize, even though we're dealing with decades old trauma. Yeah. And, and let's dig into that, that advice to activists a little bit. Um, Cause there was one line that you wrote that, that really stayed with me among others. Um, you said facing privilege is critical to building lasting trust and a stable coalition. Um, that sounds like, come from some, you know, some hard-won experience. How, how's that played out in practice in, in your advocacy? And thinking about folks in our audience, privileged people in our audience, um, how might privileged folks use that, you know, that learning in service of solidarity, use that privilege in service of solidarity? Yeah, I, I mean, I think those of anyone who cares about Latin America, well, and if you're based in the U.S., you know, the first step is to realize that you're part of an ecosystem of human rights defenders, you know, uh, democracy defenders, and there is most likely a whole ecosystem of uh, NGO human rights leaders in the countries of origin. So, in my case, in El Salvador, that has a rich history, and I can't support democracy in El Salvador without really leaning into those leaders and listening to them, following their lead when it comes to making uh, taking strategic actions in El Salvador. But it also means that I need to own my access to political power here in the U.S., which, as we know, is the biggest um, investor in, um, you know, in, our, in these countries and in democratic institutions and in, in their military aid and in, 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 in development aid. So we as U.S. citizens, Latinos in, in the U.S., we have huge privilege and power if we can influence the Biden administration or you know, folks at USAID or the State Department. We have serious uh, you know, power and we can perhaps cause change in the governments of El Salvador or other, other countries. And we've already seen that with our campaign play out. If not for our organizing around, um, you know, a few years ago with the Obama administration, then we, would, we probably wouldn't have gotten the, the then president um, of El Salvador, uh, Salvador Sanchez Seren to actually open an official uh, uh, entity that is charged with investigating the disappeared. And I really do think that's because of the U.S. influence. Mm. And then now you're seeing, you know, the USA, because of the pressure of activists in El Salvador and here, they've cut uh, significantly aid to El Salvador until the, you know, Bukele administration um, reaffirms its commitment to human rights. So that's just a small example, but I think mm -hmm. it could be a model of mm. how you influence both from the U.S., but also from El Salvador or yeah. Latin America. Yeah, no, and and those that transnational reality of our communities is a is a thing, you know, Deanna, I know that you've been writing and working on for a long time. So it's it's amazing to see that that concrete example in practice of and and how that change can happen. And it's such a resonant thing that you say for people to understand that that you, that they're part of an ecosystem of human rights defenders. Um, you know, one of the things that nourishes that ecosystem is private philanthropy, right? So so turning now to Anamari. Um, from your perch at Hispanics and Philanthropy, um, you write about a vision for what philanthropy can be um, to deploy capital for change and to build our power. Um, but we're not there yet, right? Um, what, what changes are needed in philanthropy and in our own communities for, for that vision to come about? Thanks, Chris, and thank you for the Anna to getting this book. I'm so excited to see it in person, and we should all have our own copies. Um, I love where Alex left us. Yes, we have the power, um, but we. I don't think that we see ourselves as philanthropists yet. When I first took this job, you know, I talked to my daughter, to my mom, and I'm like, you're a philanthropist. They're like, no. And I'm like, mommy, see, you're, you know, sending remesas, you know, remittances, or you're, you know, giving $25 to the United Way, or you're, you're, you're giving money. We're all philanthropists. So I think that first we need a paradigm shift in terms of who sees themselves as a philanthropist. And so that our community, which is extremely generous, and that's by the very, very few studies, but the few studies that have studied philanthropy in our community, 
like underscores that the Latino community is very generous, but our giving looks a little bit different. And so being able to study that and being able to own these studies so that it's in the public narrative, the generosity of our folks, I think that's really important because that then um, places us as givers, right? Which we are. And that then has influence when you start aggregating it. And it also is really fantastic to be able to add different, I call them pipes and channels, but different ways of giving. I mean, I'm a fan of community foundations. That's great. But there's so many other ways of giving uh, right there in California where, you know, we're being beamed into. You have the Latino Community Fund, which is doing fantastic work across California with giving circles. And like with the work that they're doing, like multiply that hundreds of times. Um, we need to shift first then the public narrative and who owns like this title of philanthropist. Another thing that needs to shift is like what traditional foundation philanthropy looks like because over 45 years and this has been studied by one of our founders. He's the first one that did it 45 years ago, Herman Gallegos, and it was 1% of foundation giving uh, institutional funders, right, uh, was going to uh, the Latino community, Latino led, led, Latino serving. That 1% number has not changed. It's gone up to 1.02 and it's gone down to 0.6, but basically <laughs> it's never gone over 1.02. And think about the Latino community 45 years ago much smaller than we are now and think about it when we're, you know, by 2030 and what's going to happen by 2050. If that 1% number sticks, as it's stuck for the past two generations, we're in big trouble because it's a whole segment of our population that is not being invested in. And yes, this is the dollars that are flexible dollars that pay for the human rights defenders, pays for after school, pays for so many other things. And so I feel like we're in a crisis moment and um, it's been a persistent challenge, but now it's going to really raise in terms of um, how we how we address it. It's not a nice thing to address. It's an urgent thing to address. Yeah. And, and I want to unpack something that you talked about um, in the, in the recap of those statistics, which are indeed alarming uh, about Latino led. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's, there's pushback on these studies about like, Oh, we support, you know, the Boyle Heights community uh, in L at Los Angeles, we don't say it's targeted to Latinos, but it's mostly Latinos who live there. So isn't that the same thing? Um, is it the same thing or what's the difference when you support Latino led organizations specifically? And why is that important? You know, the studies are the way people code things and then Candid picks it up and reports back on it. It's not a perfect science, but when you look at this latinxfunders.org, which is a dashboard that is tracking everything, it's been tracking it since 2013. And before that, we have hard copies, which Diana, my predecessor at Hispanics in Philanthropy was always fantastic to push on. Um, you can see like in the top 20, most of them are not Latino led organizations. You have wonderful organizations like Climate Works or uh, like, aspire schools and things like that but there there's a difference mm. there's a sovereignty issue right i'm married mm -hmm. to an Navajo guy so the word sovereignty <laughs> it means something to me and mm. you really do need in that c-suite uh, the people making decisions have to like, it's by, for, and about, and not to segregate, but folks that have the lived experience of our communities, and you can't get around that. You need to have folks that are, uh, have understood, granted Latinos, you know, we're not, um, a race, where an ethnicity, a lot of people say, oh, you can be Latino by corazón, by heart, <laughs> it's an affinity, but you do need to have um, people leading organizations that have that lived experience of our community. Um, and so, yeah, I don't buy it. I feel like mm -hmm. there needs to be more rigor in how those things mm -hmm. are reported on and, and counted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the real focus on on what Latina leadership looks like within mm -hmm. those and the difference that it makes. Oh, that's compelling. Absolutely. Uh, Diana, uh, you know, we're and actually for all of you, really, um, we're we're 
just, you know, an election day was yesterday. And, and as usual, folks are parsing through all of the different returns and making sense of it. And I think back to a year ago, and one of the things that were, people were parsing through was the, the proportion of Latinos who voted for Trump. Um, wh- and there were reports that, that found that surprising. Um, were you surprised by that? Yes, I was surprised, uh, you know, um, but um, but it, there are explanations, you know, no community is monolithic, no community is homogeneous. And um, I believe that in certain states, Texas and Florida in particular, you know, there were um, issues uh, that resonated with some Latino uh, voters that in the past had voted uh, Democratic. Now, let's keep in mind, you know, that more than 60 percent of the Latino vote is um, is Democratic. Um, And that number has only grown election by election. That being said, I think, you know, when a party decides to focus on one state, you know, perhaps Pennsylvania or Arizona at the risk of losing another state like Texas or Florida, you know, what that means is that it gives the other party an opening. And I think that's what happened in 2020. There were foreign uh, policy issues like Venezuela and Cuba that played into the Republican hand. But you're never going to have 100 percent of Latinos be a part of one party or the other. You know, and I think that's a good thing. Um, And, you know, there there are the the important thing for both parties to remember is, you know, last year in 2020, you know, more than 50 percent of Latino eligible voters voted. We were one in every 10 voter. And that number is only growing in places like Arizona, for example. You know, our vote went from about 44 percent to over 60 percent. Those are important numbers. And, you know, we all, my book, our book is called If We Want to Win, you know, and I think it's a reference, of course, to elections. It's more a reference, you know, to a broader concept of winning because we all win. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we want to win in 22 and in 24, we need to make be making long term investments. We need to be thinking about, you know, all the Latino voters that are turning 18 this year and next year and the year after that, because we're a very young population. So um, narrative is part of making that case. And, you know, our book talks about the power of narrative, the power of Anamari's story, the power of Alex's story, the power of all of us messaging why democracy in this country is important. And it's also important in our countries of origin, where our diaspora communities, whether we're Cuban or Mexican or Salvadorian, where we can play a role in those democracies, because in fact, many of us are sending home remittances, many of us have family, and democracy is not just about the US, although that's very important because we're all US Americans, but it's also very important in our countries of origin. And, you know, and if we have one thing to export, it's that democracy. And Latinos are a natural civic, you know, citizen diplomats and citizen activists in the support of those democracies in our countries. Mm. And that really ties back to to the example that, that Alex was sharing, right? Of that kind of activism, transnationally in the in the US and and back in El Salvador in your case and you alluded to this Alex but um mm-hmm. about sort of what the what the latest is with with regard to that that activism right in the chapter it sort of you know it narrates you know an administration here an administration there are more or less favorable and you know as a reader i was i was left hanging oh you know at, around the time of publication the Biden administration was coming into power and 
you alluded to some of this, but but for those of us who want to, you know, be up on on the latest on on what the on what that ongoing search is to understand the fates of the disappeared and begin healing in the ways that you talked about, you know, as an example of that, further example of that transnational advocacy that Diana talked about, what's what's the latest? What should we know? Um, you know, El Salvador, as I mentioned earlier, is in a very delicate, um, uh, I would say, at risk um, position right now. So the the population is starting to realize that the person they elected, um, you know, President Bukele, may actually not be in favor of, you know, a true democracy. And so um, you're seeing a rapid increase in public protests uh, across the country with the the first one in September. And then two weeks ago, they had the second one. You know, um, a lot of it at first on the surface was around the adoption of Bitcoin as an official currency. Um, but really, you know, the protests quickly, you know, if you read the news or if you dug deeper into the into the articles, people are re- are, are very scared about um, the administration coming after uh, activists. And they already have they've um, incarcerated or they've issued uh, arrest warrants for political leaders, for uh, human rights activists. Um, the State Department is saying that they're concerned. Um, but. I think, you know, what I'm what's giving me courage is that Salvadorans are are coming together and they are protesting publicly, even though there's probably risk to them. And you're seeing Salvadorans here in the U.S. We're trying to organize ourselves on social media, actually, to really do kind of um, a digital form of protest, because um, for better or worse, the uh, Bukele is uh, very influenced by social media. And that's one of his Achilles heels and it, it, you know, uh, really sending him messages or protesting on Twitter, for example, does seem to get reactions. Um, but really the next step is, I think, the way, at least for our campaign, we are definitely focusing on influencing and uh, around strategic actions with um, influencing the Biden administration. So we're gonna be organizing probably a visit to DC in the next six months. We're going to be organizing letters and calls to um, influential Congress people. Um, but that's probably our best lever at this point. And I would argue for most of Latin America right now, given the current regimes, as our best chance is to organize and, and flex our democratic voice here in the U.S. We owe it to our brothers and sisters in Latin America. Um, I think that is a big part of what makes, of, you know, as Ana Maria and Diana have mentioned, that is at the core, at the heart of our identity as Latina, Latina, Latinx. We have these incredibly strong roots, uh, whether you're first generation, second generation. I think that is a through line in our culture that uh, whether you speak Spanish or not, your family definitely passes down those stories. And we also pass down the intergenerational trauma. And I think if we can invest, those of us in philanthropy or in government, if we can invest now more than ever in providing the right support to let Latina leaders, to our communities, then we can really activate their civic engagement mm. um, and influence policies here in the US and in Latin America. And I would also argue that, um, you know, the powers that be in the Democratic and, Rep- and Republican parties are, are missing the mark in investing, especially in progressive young Latino leaders. Arizona for me is the case example of what could happen across the country if we if we invest in that way and if we hold up those leaders in that way. Uh, it's remarkable what they did, and it wasn't just this one election. They they have been grass those grassroots leaders have been organizing for decades, and 2020 was the culmination of all of that grassroots organizing. And I think we owe it to if we want to see bigger change across our country and in Latin America. Those are the leaders we need to be investing in. So my hope is that 2022 won't be as scary, but, you know, we need to do the right kinds of investments. Right. And and there's and there's so much that can be done within the the frameworks of 501c3 funding, which is about voter, you know, voter voter education um, turnout. But, you know, uh, nonpartisan in the way that it's that it's done. And there's a lot of yeah of education of, of lawmakers that can happen through that as well, which is important to note. So Anamari, as, as you listen to what Alex is saying about those different forms of advocacy and what's needed, you know, both in the US and and in 
and in Latin America. And, and you think about the range of, of tools um, that fit under that broad umbrella of philanthropy. What are the, what are some of the things that you're, you know, especially excited about, or, you know, that might be able to um, respond to that call for supporting youth leadership in the way that Alex is talking about? Well, I think it's first and foremost important for funders, whether that be, you know, institutional funders or individual funders, more and more it's individual funders um, mm -hmm. that are making the difference. And so I'm te when I talk about funders, I'm doing shorthand about folks that are giving small dollars, big dollars, and it's individuals and, and institutions. Well, something that Diana said was very important and deserves a underscore, and mm. that's about our identity, that we are not a monolith. Um, most of us do self-identify countries of origin. And so that's very complicated to understand because there's, you know, 60 million of us and we, you know, you're, you can be fully Colombian, you can be half Cuban, half Puerto Rican like me, right? And how do you, how do you develop a program or initiatives that are going to be inclusive and, and taking into consideration um, this is such a broad community. And so I think the first thing is really trying to understand and that takes deep understanding is not superficial understanding. So we really need to, uh, and you, by having one program officer or like having somebody come and doing a DEI training is not gonna cut it. You really need to make a commitment to understand what is this community, what are the issues? And that is gonna really be different depending on geography and so many other things. Um, until we do that, this is going to persist. Um, I think two other things that I would think about is who's actually the decision maker. We have studies that are happening every two years looking at um, who, who works in philanthropy. And uh, the numbers are increasing a little bit uh, when you get to like the program officer level. But when you look at the C-suite level, you don't have that. And it, the numbers are even worse at the trustee level. So who's representing and who's developing the high level strategy? It's not trustees that, again, I talked about it earlier, that have the lived experience. This is not something that's just nice to do. These organizations, foundations, given that they're working to improve opportunities, you know, improve what the this country looks like, and uh, how we're experiencing the country, whether they're working on environment or education or health or what be it, um, we don't have folks that are uh, representing the community. They're not going to get to mission. The third thing that I'll mention is uh, my good friend, uh, Lori Villarosa, just came out with a report that I love. She heads uh, the Philanthropic Initiative for Racial Equity, PRI, and it's called the Mismatched. So I think a lot of what I'm talking about is mismatches in different spaces. But Lori's report about mismatch also looks at accountability. And so accountability um, with trustees and who works for you is important. Accountability as to where the money is going. I talked about Candid earlier. Candid is the organization and with um, uh, just to make sure everyone knows I'm on the board. I love Candid, um, an amazing organization. And they're tracking and counting what philanthropy, who's giving it, where it's going. After the murder of George Floyd, there was a flurry of commitments, of pledges, um, and they counted those. And they counted $8.8 .8 billion. Uh, they, there were other reports. That I know that uh, Bridge Benham um, Policy Link did one report, and that was they counted $11.9 billion, with a B, dollars in pledges for racial equity, racial justice. This is astounding. Um, Candid did it, and when Candid took out the double counting, um, it was down to 8.8 .8 billion. So the number starts going down. Mm -hmm. When Pre did the counting, and like what monies actually were committed uh, for mm -hmm. the Latino-led, Latino-serving organizations, and um, that wasn't for they they took out all of the internal DEI focused stuff that um, mm -hmm. 
that were counted in the pledges, that number went down to, drumroll, $3.4 billion. Um, and a lot of those dollars still have not made it to exactly to the communities to which they were promised. So I think that we have to get a lot better at demanding accountability and not letting people get away with these fake pledges and commitments. Um, because if you look at these numbers, you think that everything's okay and that money's flowing to solve these problems in a collective way. But it's not. That's a farce. So that that accountability and that transparency, they go together. And, and there's a role for all of us to, to call for that greater accountability. Exactly. Um, Dan, I, I can't help but think, but this is something that you've, that you've seen over the years in, in your time um, uh, leading Hispanics and philanthropy. I, I guess this is really a question for all of you all. Um, you know, in different ways, each of us has been working for years to understand and reverse that institutional disinvestment in Latino communities. What's behind it at the end of the day? Why, why does it persist? Why do those numbers continue to be so low? Talked about lack of representation. That's part of it. What else? And so if, if I can jump in, um, I think these are structural issues, okay? Um, much in the way, you know, that foundations, you know, work and individual donors, you know, work with certain uh, lawyers and certain um, organizations. But this is what I would say, okay? If I was Jeff Bezos and my father was Miguel Bezos from Santiago de Cuba, I would be putting a billion dollars into Hispanics and philanthropy right now. You know why? Because it's the best investment that you can make. If I was Tom Steyer, if I was the Sandler family, if I was all of those, you know, important individual donors, I would be putting my money there because, because this is where the vote is going. This is what our economic prosperity depends in. This is what our cultural vibrance depends in. And I think this decade is important beyond measure. I think in this decade, we become the prosperous, democratic, pluralistic society that we can be, or we fall back. We fall back and we surrender the leadership that we have had in the world and in climate change and in all of the other areas. So, so I think, you know, philanthropy is it's not just about, you know, giving away, you know, uh, tax sheltered dollars. It's about intention. And mm -hmm. so I would say to all of those large donors, you have an opportunity to reverse that and, you know, to reverse a, you know, 40 years of underfunding. You have an opportunity to influence the vote, to influence, you know, our policy towards countries in Latin America that are important trading partners. Um, you, you have an opportunity to touch the people that are most impacted by climate change and who are the next generation of leaders in the climate change you know, area. So, you know, I think there's there's no question about it. It's it's a matter of making good investments. It's not about liking this group versus that group. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, if you're listening to me, Miguel Bezos and Jeff Bezos, you know, um, let's all run to HIP and to the Mauricio Aquino Foundation and to a number of other, you know, organizations that are doing the infrastructure work. Let's remember that the African-American community had an infrastructure of civil rights organizations, of public interest groups, of sororities and fraternities, and that supported by many partners and allies who were not African-Americans is what changed the laws in this country. I mean, it is in my lifetime. When I arrived in New Orleans in 1960, Black people were at the back of the bus and my elementary school was segregated. 
you know, this is what our country was. We need to move forward. And one way to move forward is by making these investments and making these investments for the long run. Hmm. Well said. Alex, I'm curious, you're coming out of an experience of working at the East Bay Community Foundation, um, where that was a, a community foundation of the type that, that Anna Mari referenced earlier, that is taking on this challenge, right, of uh, engaging individual donors, engaging wealthy donors in the East Bay um, in, a, in a more direct way to talk about racial equity and the need for this type of uplifting narrative that, that Deanna's uh, laying out. What did you uh, uh, recognizing that you that you left your post there last week and and are, will soon be on to the next thing? Um, but just curious if you have any early reflections about what that experience has been like, you know, to engage with donors, particularly, you know, in in giving to a predominantly African American city like Oakland. Um, yeah, I mean, I I'm definitely reflecting on that. I'm incredibly grateful for my five years at, at the East Bay Community Foundation, and to James Head, also the the CEO and president, who also recently stepped down. Um, it's I think what EBCF got right uh, and can be a model for other philanthropic institutions is um, going in the vein of what we were talking about earlier: who we hired. So James Head was very in intentional about creating a senior team, a, a C-suite full of people of color, people with lived experiences who came from certain communities that have been historically marginalized in the East Bay and who had, you know, the experience and the chops to think about a vision of a more just region. We, our tagline was a just East Bay. And um, we also, we, as part of that, you know, hiring, we also hired grassroots organizers as our programs team was completely uh, re-envisioned and we hired folks who had done grassroots campaign work uh, or grassroots community organizing for decades who came from historically marginalized communities as well. And so suddenly you saw a, a foundation put together a new mission statement that put racial equity at its core we and we completely redid our discretionary grant making so that we were dedicating all of it to primarily BIPOC organizations who really had a strong understanding of the, at the intersection of direct service and long term systems change. And in, in terms of engaging with donors, we completely remade our team as well so that we brought on folks who had an appetite or experience with viewing donors, not just as check uh, checkbooks, but as full political allies, potential political allies. And so part of the work that I think all of us in philanthropy have in front of us is to keep engaging, re-engaging, and really follow through with commitments around equity, but in particular racial equity. And that means, you know, internal, who you hire, who you put on your board, but also what programs you fund, and really understanding that if we are going to make a dent in some of these you know, challenging issues that we're facing across the country and Latin America, then it's not just about direct service. You really have to be courageous enough to invest in political advocacy, policy change, long-term systems change, and that um, and that there's leaders out there who have been doing this. There's organizations that HIP knows, there's organizations that all of our foundations know who are at the front lines right now doing that grassroots organizing around different policy measures, um, and we're and they're just not getting the funding that they need. And going back to your original question, uh, question Chris, I do think it, it is partly and maybe in large part due to the ongoing effects of white supremacy in this country, how this country was built, who's in power, you know, political power, and it, it is still a, a largely white male field. And until we really grapple with that history and not in a way necessarily to make people, you know, go after people personally. Um, but we all have a lot of, um, a lot of healing work, a lot of trauma to, you know, to really deal with. Even, even those of us who are um, Latin American, I think this is also the next big fight for our community is to really deal and face the, the very deep anti-Blackness we have in the Latinx mm -hmm. of the Latina community. Um, we, you know, we, we just have not properly acknowledged it and done our own healing. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably getting, going off on a tangent, but I do think ultimately it is about um, anti-Blackness. It is about white supremacy, if we're, gonna, if we're really going to make a dent in anything. 
Yeah, let's actually dig in on that. I, I wanted to go there next, and thank you for naming it, Alex. Also want to encourage folks uh, in the audience, if you have questions, feel free to use uh, the YouTube comments or the, the, the question feature there. Uh, we would love to speak to any questions that are coming up for folks. Um, but yeah, thank you for naming that, Alex. And, and you know, uh, uh, combating act of anti-Blackness in, in our own communities is a, is a paramount struggle. And I like the way that you put it, that that's the next big struggle within our communities. So how, how are you seeing that in the work that you do? How are you all taking that on? What types of groups do you see taking that on? Where are the areas uh, of encouragement that you see? Where are the areas of challenges? Um, let's, start, let's talk a little bit about work within our own communities, right? About, about combating colorism and anti-Blackness. What gives you hope, what encourages you about that work? So um, in, what encourages me um, is uh, my two granddaughters who are Black Latinas. Uh, one is 13 and the other is about to turn uh, 10, who embrace both of their, um, uh, their uh, cultural identities and racial identities. And uh, the, you know, the fact that more of our families, uh, you know, uh, Latinos are more likely to marry another race um, than, you know, many other uh, many other groups. But I think the fact that Alex is mentioning it, that I know Hispanics in philanthropy has a racial equity on all the work that it does. I think the fact that uh, Nelson Colon and the Puerto Rico Community Foundation is putting together a racial equity institute for the Americas because racism looks different in certain areas of the United States and also, um, you know, where there was slavery in, in Latin America. I think the focus on this issue, you know, gives me gives me hope. You know, we have to start with ourselves and racism is one of the issues but, you know, machismo is also another issue. You know, misogyny runs deep. One of the articles in our book, if we want to win, is about domestic abuse. Our ra rates of domestic abuse are, you know, through the roof. We have to come to terms with that. Like Alex said, we have to own that trauma. And one of the things that Anjanette de Gallo talks about is precisely, you know, the fact that, um, that we have to talk about it. We can't just, you know, pretend that it doesn't happen. Yeah. We have to talk about it. We have to bring it out and we've got to do something. I can step in. Yeah. Similarly, Thanks. As um, Alex was talking about making long run investments in systems change, what comes to mind is that this is not like this is not a, a moment like the black moment. It, this, this has to be like a forever <laughs> um, time. It's, it, it can't be a blip. So these investments that we're talking about in terms of in our organizations have to be both right now and continuing. Um, when we talk about centering BIPOC, it's black, indigenous, people of color. Um, and so we have to start with that understanding that yes, this country was built on the backs of, 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 of black people that were brought obviously in, involuntarily. Um, the Smithsonian just had a couple of weeks ago also uh, Indian slavery, a really amazing piece on that, recognizing I think is the first step uh, of everything. And then there's really important work and you don't have to invent it. There's the, the framework of um, awake to woke to work and understanding that it's, it, it's a whole circle and that you have to do it yourself. Organizations have to do it as a, as, as a system. Communities have to do this work. Uh, but what is the legacy that we have all lived in? And it's not that anybody is a bad person, we all have biases and just understand that this is just something that is a constant thing. And so as an organization, we're doing that. We are um, working with and also funding other organizations that are living this 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 work and um, just being real honest and willing to be vulnerable. Willing to be vulnerable is something that very few of us are good at, uh, but we have to get better at that. Mm. 
Oh, that's that's really profound. Um, for myself, I give I, I'm given hope by work that you see in Latin America that, um, to your point about BIPOC, like encompasses Afro descendant and indigenous leaders, right? Out of our out of our Andean region and in, based in Bogota at the Ford Foundation, um, that's been a, a real focus of our work over the last several years is Afro descendant and and indigenous leaders, and they sort of get grouped together, um, that's the way they're they're understood in the political system, incorporated into the constitution and, and ensured representation politically. Um, and so I, there are rich opportunities for um, understanding what, you know, that term intersectionality looks like in practice, a common experience of marginalization, but also of lifting up uh, the leadership and the, and the wisdom from within uh, those communities. Chris, we all have to be allies to each other and we all have to stand together. And it's not, we have to get rid of this very European centric, like a pie that gets, you know, gets divided. And we just have to grow the pie and understand that we all really do need to stand together. It's just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. For Latinos, I mean, a quarter of our folks are, Indigenous, a quarter of our folks self-identify as Black, if you look at the recent census numbers. So we are clearly multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and um, that's at our core. And so, oops, did we lose you? And so, and so that's... Um, Apologies. Yeah, begin there. Yeah, no, and, that's the, mm-hmm. and I'm sorry that I mm-hmm. missed that for a little bit, but, it, but if what I heard... Um, uh, the multiracial reality of our communities, right? I've heard it said that that a third of Latin Americans have African descent. So we need to start understanding that um, that part of that dimension of our heritage and lifting that up within leadership within our own communities. Good. Uh, so we have a couple of, of questions from from the audience. Um, talking about the the threat to democracy uh, that that had been referenced earlier. Um, are you all aware of any efforts to strengthen commitment in Latina communities to democratic procedures that are under threat now from state level voting restrictions? Right. So you see these bills at a state level that are that are, um, you know, restricting voting rights. Anything on on your radar screen focusing particularly on engaging Latina communities in the in the in the pushback against those restrictions? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm a little familiar with the state I'm most familiar so, with. You know, Alex. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Deanna. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to mention that the only state that I'm slightly aware of is Texas. Um, I have some good friends who are the EDs of local education nonprofits there. And, you know, one of the big fights that Texas has been, um, you know, uh, facing is the elimination of ethnic studies. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those of us in California where this is kind of a given and it's part of our curriculum here in the public school systems, it's, it's, it's shocking to think that another state with such a huge, uh, Latino population might be getting rid of, uh, such a core, um, class. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm aware of that fight. And there's a lot of, um, great organizations in Texas that are organizing there. I wouldn't be surprised if Latina led health, reproductive health organizations are gearing up and organizing with the latest, um, the bill that was passed there that's made its way up to the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, that's really the only state I'm aware of. I, I am, I'm absolutely certain that there are hundreds, if not thousands of Latino led nonprofits who are, you know, part of coalitions and gearing up. Mm-hmm. And we need to be investing in those groups. And I think the best source to get to get to those groups is probably through organizations uh, like HIP. Um, or through local, you know, community foundations who have a, um, a social justice mission, like, like the East Bay Community Foundation. Mm-hmm. Those are the two ways that I think we can best support those groups, uh, unless you have direct access on the ground in your, in your community. Chris, I was going to add on to that. We yeah. have an initiative mm-hmm. called Power Building and Justice, which we just launched earlier this year. And there's literally 100 hundreds of grantees all across the country that is doing this kind of work. Texas and the big states that like come to our attention as the states that have strong Latino uh, communities and demographics, Florida, New York, make the road in New York. There's just so many, Um, but there's so many 
in other states that we don't think about, like North Carolina and Georgia and Louisiana, mm. all of these communities are have very fast growing Latino populations. I think uh, Georgia, last time I looked, is the state that has the largest, like the fastest growing Latino community uh, population. And so there's hundreds, they're all across the country. And I mean, I'm happy to go offline and, and share some of the list of organizations, depending on what people want to learn. But um, it's important that we invest not just in the get out the vote in the educating, but in their infrastructure as well, because they can't do mm -hmm. this for free. I think what we saw during COVID was really difficult because mm -hmm. folks were both um, suffering the effects of COVID and the recession. So they were protagonists in this whole, like in everything that was happening, as well as frontline uh, defenders and essential workers all at the same time. And how can a human being do that? And how can they do it with that when they're not getting paid a livable wage? So we really need to invest in that. Um, oftentimes I, people ask me yeah. to put to, and that they want to invest in programs, but they want all of the money mm. to go to direct, like the direct yeah. services. And I'm always pushing, you need to fund the indirect, indirect or admin costs are not a bad thing. That's how the community, that these organizations stay strong are able to pay for benefits for their employees um and so that's really important when you're thinking about um how to serve and how to make your donations stronger yeah thank you diana you wanted to get in there and I did. Um, and so um, I think, you know, Naleo and Mi Familia Boda, very important. And then there are these groups like Presente.org and Mi Gente, you know, uh, which are reaching, you know, the younger voters and it's all social media and online. Um, I think there's plenty of organizations. And the great thing about it is that by building this infrastructure, by supporting that new leadership, you know, we're building impact for long haul, you know, and to go back to our book, uh, the, uh, if we want to win, you know, our vision for the decade is, you know, that this group of Latino voters, the ones that are 18 to 24 now, all of them, but in particular, the ones that are 18 to 24 are a really powerful voting block. And we need to get their narrative out. We need to talk to them. We need to convince them that their vote and their organizing and their civic life is really important. I have to get in there, Chris, um, because what yeah. Diana says, I mean, a lot of what we're seeing in all of these elections, it's it's because of the Latino community got in there and voted or didn't get in there and vote. And so if we're not investing in in tech, in social media, in mobile friendly, um, it's not going to work. We were investing in very high level, like relationship building and knocking on doors. And, but that's not the world as it is anymore. Our community is the most like so digital oriented, especially the young people. And so um, however, whatever information you want to get, it needs to go in that direction and it has to, um, it has to tick those boxes. Great. Um, one, uh, couple more questions before we wrap in the next few minutes. Um, one from the audience. Um, what thoughts do the panelists have about investing in public education, which schools the vast majority of Latina children? We haven't talked about education in this context, but um, where does investing in public education fit in this mosaic that we've been talking about? That's the base for everything, not just for our Latino kids, but for all kids. We have to learn how to analyze what we're reading, uh, you know, to understand and to unpack and to ask critical questions. So um, to be, have a democracy that's functioning, we need to have investment in education. And if we have want to have a strong competitive workforce, we need to have education. I mean, that's that's key for me. Yeah, and I would add that it's not just yeah. about in investing in um, in the direct service groups in the education space, but it's mm -hmm. really for me the big fight is um, you know at the state level across various states and and making the reforms necessary at, at the budget level so that we're actually investing properly. You know, California is a, an, an amazing example. I think we're what forty fifth in terms of per pupil spending. 
and which is, you know, a travesty and and we should be ashamed of ourselves. We had the chance last year at the 2020 election to reform our current system that does limit, um, it, it ties public school funding to property taxes, residential property taxes. And we had a, a measure on the ballot that would have freed up billions for our California schools, um, you know, and, and unfortunately it did not pass, but by a very small margin. Mm. So the groups are gearing up and preparing. Um, and that was really possible that the chance that we were, the, the fact that we were so close at reforming you know, California, how we fund public schools in California was a direct result of coalitions, multiracial coalitions, mm -hmm. decades in the making. And funders like TCE and Cal Wellness who got in there and supported these coalitions, you know, that's exactly what all, all, these, all these funders should be doing. Really being, uh, trusting the leadership of uh, Latino and Black and other communities of color and they were the ones that put together the agenda, the policy the reforms that they wanted. And philanthropy kind of took the step back. But it was a big deal for philanthropy, in my view, to do that kind of C4 investments. We need to be doing more of it. And I think that's the way to improve education is to really um, donors and, and foundations to get in there and do the and invest in those groups doing the policy reform. Excellent. Well, thank you to the audience for these great questions. Um, before we officially wrap, it's a tradition here to ask all our speakers the following question, and we'll wrap on this. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? Um, Deanna, would you like to start? My 60-second idea to change the world is to, for each one of us, to ask ourselves, you know, how humanity can improve, you know, by really finding common cause and then changing that into social change uh, strategies um, and moving forward. Thank you. Alex. Um, this one's a little off the wall, but I'm going to go with <laughs> therapy for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I really do think that um, the world would look a lot different if um, people had the supports in uh, in place to really deal with their personal and their maybe intergenerational trauma. I think a lot of the issues we're facing are due to people not 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 understanding who they are and not not doing the necessary healing. Thank you, Anamari. Okay, I'm gonna go with. Um, everyone using their power, their privilege, and their influence. We have so much of it, and most of it remains untapped. So call your local community foundation. Call the corporations which you are so loyal to and demand that they pay attention to these things and that they that they uh, fund and invest um, in, in our communities in a, in a way that... Um, reflects what our communities look like. I think about just like in the Latino community, if we were able to grow by 10% uh, over the next 10 years, what we're currently giving, getting, which is that 1% that I talked about earlier, um, we would grow the 500 million that's being given out nationally to Latino, -led, Latino serving to, I think if I'm doing the math right, it's like 5 billion. What can we do? For, with five billion, a whole lot of the work that we've been talking about. So it's exciting to me too. Excellent. Think about that. Thank you, Diana Campoamor, Ana Maria Gilagos, and Alexandra Aquino Fike for joining me today at Inform at the Commonwealth Club. A reminder that if we want to win, a Latina vision for a new American democracy can be purchased through your preferred bookseller. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Chris Cardona. Thank you and take care. <laughs>